Our next speaker is Jonathan Mueller. Uh, Jonathan is also a member of the ISO C++ committee. One more. <laughs> and uh, he currently works at uh, ThinkCell. And the new library on the block. Let's yes. see what is it. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, so I work at ThinkCell. We have our essentially our custom standard library, it's sort of like Boost, um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about it. It's pretty cool, it's open source. I'm just gonna show you some of the stuff uh, we have there. So, we're hiring. So, if you want to come work with me, obviously, right, um, which is why I'm here. We'll be, out of, we'll be out of socks, unfortunately, but we still have other stuff to win at the booth. Um, but, anyways, yes, so this is the core library for ThinkSA. Um, so, we are less than 30 full time developers working on a product in a 20 year old mono repo. Um, the library is continuously up and everything in the code base is continuously updated to the latest standards. So we use C++ features as soon as the compiler supports them. Um, and we are sort of, we, we, we do a bunch of experiments with the library to try various things out, see how they work out, integrate it, and if, and if it works out great, otherwise we roll back. So we are continuously able to experiment and refactor with it. So it's open source. Um, it's sort of similar philosophy to the Boost library. It's an extension, complement, improvement on the standard library. It's not one monolithic thing. You can pick the parts you like. Uh, but crucially, we don't guarantee any backwards compatibility because we want to be able to keep improving it without regards um, to existing code. So the library has a contains of multiple parts. Um, I'm going to begin with one part that is sort of the foundation, which improves C++ as a language. Um, so, for example, we've got casts. So in C, we had a single cast operator. And this cast can be used to, for example, truncate a flow to an int. Or you can interpret an object as bytes, or you can convert a pointer to an int and even like a short int, which like does like extra loss of data for you. And we can even remove quotes. And all of this with a single cast operator. And so C improved about it. So there are now dedicated cast operators to do various things. But a static cast on its own can also do a bunch of stuff. Um, for example, static cast can be used to truncate a web arithmetic service. Or you can call a constructor or conversion operator. Or you can convert character types to other arithmetic types or float. Or you can convert enums to arithmetic types. Or you can do downcast, upcast in a class hierarchy. Or you can convert void star to t star and the other way around. You, uh, you can also use it to move values. And you can, like, the cast to voids to the nonce card. And we looked at it similar to the C++ designers look, looking at C and that this is too much, we're going to split it up into various casts. So we've got TC explicit cast, it's a standard library, it's in our standard library function um, that does like the important part of static cast. Um, it can convert between classes if that conversion is safe, more about that later. It can convert between actual numbers um, with like a debug check against loss. So you can have like pre prevent implicit truncation there with an assertion. Um, you can convert between characters, uh, again with debug check, and you can convert null types like unique pointer to bool. And that's it. This is sort of like the most common situations where you want to use static cast, but we will use a dedicated thing that only supports that. Similar to how C++ introduced dedicated casts. So we also gave it a version that takes multiple arguments. Um, and so this one essentially calls the constructor or conversion operator for us. It can also do aggregate initialization and we use it to have like, a, to essentially to add constructors to standard library types which we can control. So for example, the standard library finally added ranges two to convert an arbitrary range to container. And we had that for ages using explicit cast. Like, so explicit cast is a customization point and we can sort of add like a constructor to vector or string to convert an arbitrary range to a vector or string. So explicit cast is safe. So we do a bunch of type checks in there. So for example, uh, we don't allow slicing by default. Um, we prevent stuff like creating a, a span from, a, uh, from an R value uh, and preventing reference to temporary. And this works by using these concepts, safely convertible to and safely constructible from, which uh, there can then be then, so by default, we assume everything is safe. Uh, and then we should have a bunch of specializations to mark specific things unsafe. And the idea behind uh, that is that once we fixed like the built-in stuff, like a conversion from into short, which we mark as unsafe, um, 
all new types that we add, we will only add constructors if it's really safe. So like making it safe by default and having an explicit opt-out is actually the correct choice here because most of the new type is already designed properly. So explicit cast is the cast we pick by default. Uh, it replaces our static cast. And then all the other uses of static cast, well, they get explicit operations, uh, like as unsigned or as signed, or to underlying, from underlying. We've got dedicated cast to cast in the class hierarchy, void cast and discard, and so on. So we've got like dedicated cast operations for the special stuff and explicit cast for the, just the generic, please convert this value to that thing using debug checks, using compile term checks as possible. Another problem in C++ are function pointers. So function pointers aren't that great. Um, for example, once you've got an overload set, you can't really form a function pointer to it because the compiler doesn't know which address you want. You also, this code is technically not allowed because you're passing the address of a standard library function uh, and the standard reserves the right to add more overloads and in particular there is an overload for is lower in the locale header, so this code only compiles depending on which headers you've included before. And if you want to use function pointer, for example, in std map, this will add an additional eight bytes to every map object to store a pointer to the function, even though you only want that particular one. And the replacement for all of that is lambdas, because with lambdas, you don't have any of the problems, but it's annoying to create a lambda. Uh, so we have a macro, right? The classic macro to take an arbitrary expression and turn that into a lambda. It uses a perfect forwarding, actually conditional no except, um, but, uh, uh, but it, I forgot to put it on the slide, uh, takes arbitrary arguments, is sphenary friendly, and re returns the result. And then all of those problems are solved. Um, because in the first line, you don't have, um, and you have an overload set, but we get that as a single lambda, which can handle all overloads. Um, you can pass it to all of, because you're not taking the address of a standard library function. And when you pass it to map, it's an empty thing, so we don't store additional data. Right? It's a very convenient thing. But it's a macro, right? And macros are even. Well, Bjarne himself said that almost every macro demonstrates a flaw in the programming language in the program or in the program. And this is a flaw in the programming language. Right? We, we solve it the only way we can by using a macro. Like we don't want to keep writing all this stuff to create a lambda all the time, so we just add a macro to solve this thing, but really this is a flaw in the programming language that should have been solved in the programming language. Uh, similarly, member pointers, um, same deal. Um, they, they have got this, so function pointer, you get the regular call syntax, but with member pointer, you've got this weird syntax with d dot star and so on, and like the same thing with overload sets and store state and so on. And so we've got another macro for those, right? Um, member and mempun, uh, and this wraps essentially the dot or the error access into a thing. So if, uh, crucially, we can do, even do stuff like an example, so we can write tcmempun dot size, and this creates a lambda that calls dot size on whatever is the argument. And then we can pass that around and give it anything that has a dot size and use it. And it's like really convenient um, to add things to algorithms. The C++ Ranger standard library has this thing called projections. We can, for example, sort by a member by passing it a member pointer. Uh, and we instead use a lambda and tcmem for that. And then we, uh, we still have an invoke. Um, but it does something slightly different because the standard invoke needs to handle like member pointers and other things. Um, we static assert those because we don't want function pointers or member pointers anywhere in our code base. We only want lambdas. Um, instead, we do automatic expansion of tuple like objects, um, which means encode like this. So, this is an add function that takes two arguments, uh, and you can invoke it by giving it two arguments, or you can give it a pair or a tuple or an array. Um, this is really convenient once you're dealing with stuff like zip, which like zips multiple ranges and returns a tuple of ranges. Uh, but then you don't want to have all your functions pass in a tuple. Um, so like that invoke, which is in, used in all the range algorithms, automatically unpacks it, is really convenient. Um, and the reason this is a macro uh, has to do with the way we handle temporaries. I'm going to give a 90-minute talk about it at a different conference. Essentially, we've implemented half of Rust's power checker in order to prevent the return of dangling temporaries. Yeah, uh, this is the zip example. So like tc 4 h of zip, like you want... A, it ranges over the first thing, and B, ranges over the second thing, and you just want to handle it. You don't want to get like a tuple in there that you have to manually unpack. So it's really convenient that invoke does that. So the second thing is we, we, li we like fluent expressive code. So we've got a bunch of utilities for that. So for example, um, the classical book Elements of Programming makes a distinction between actions and transformations. 
Um, so for example, a transformation is something that takes a value and returns a new value, whereas an action is something that takes a reference and modifies it in place. And they're sort of the same, but they're duals of each other. You can write any action as a transformation and any transformation as an action um, using this function. So modify um, takes a transformation and turns it into an action by just taking the reference and then modifying it in place. And modified uh, takes an um, action and returns a transformation. Uh, so it turns it into a transformation by returning like a transformed version. And we do, can do an optimization here. So if you're giving an, an R value reference, we can modify it in place since we don't care about the old value. Otherwise, we create a copy, modify the copy in place, and return it. So it doesn't really matter which way you write it. Except, of course, um, there is a performance difference, right? Um, doing a sort in place is more efficient than doing a transformation that returns a sorted container. So I think there'll be only right actions for everything. Um, this includes stuff like operator increment. Like we use an increment for the operator, but not uh, for the iterator, but not next. Because next is a transformation which needs to create a copy, so it is less efficient. And we have a macro um, to turn any action into a transformation, right? So we can say, for example, so we've got our sort action. We want to turn that um, into a transformation by using TC modified. Give me the container, please sort it in place. Or TC modified, give me the iterator, please increment it. Um, and so even though we only use action, we got the flexibility of having transformations as well by, with the help of this macro, which simply creates a lambda that does, like, takes the expression, grabs it in a lambda, and passes it to modified. And that way we get the best of both worlds. We also like using optional a lot. So for example, we want to compute a result. This returns an optional, and then we want to get the value or compute a fallback. Um, now, we might use value or, but the problem with value or is that the co compute fallback is always computed. Right here, we will only compute it when we actually need it, but with value or, we will always call the function even though we might actually have a value. So instead, we force lazy evaluation by wrapping it in TC lazy. So TC lazy is another macro. We, we like macros to solve problems. Um, that forces lazy evaluation of the function argument. Uh, and so the idea is that it leverages implicit conversion. Uh, the signature of optional value or takes an arbitrary thing, uh, and if it needs to fall back, it, the final return will trigger an implicit conversion to T. And so by giving it something that is implicitly convertible to the result of a lambda, um, we can pass that to value or. So TC lazy takes an expression, wraps it in a lambda, and gives the, wraps this lambda in this type. And this type is implicitly convertible, uh, which calls the thing. So when we pass that to value or, we're just passing a lambda, which doesn't do anything. And when we reach the return statement, this triggers an implicit conversion. And only then do we actually compute the result. So we've got sort of lazy evaluation of function arguments uh, in a sense. So the, uh, this is the code. Of course, C++ uh, 20 or 23 added or else, which is value or that takes the lambda the function directly. Um, so this solves uh, that thing. Um, but we. We are using our own optional since C we still don't have optional references in the C++ standard. And why add value or and or else when we might as well just use TC lazy, right? It's a simpler interface. We can do the same thing. So the standard has all these monadic operations, a value or and or else, and then also and then, which takes an optional and a function and either invokes the function with the result and returns it um, or returns another. So it sort of modifies a, a, modifies a thing in place. Um, and we I think so. We just have value or and end then. So value or takes an optional like thing and either returns the value or the fallback. And by using it to get or else, we use TC lazy. And, and then takes an optional and a function and either transforms this thing using the function uh, or returns the default, the null up version of that thing. Uh, and then the transform thing can be written uh, using like by chaining it, wrapping it in optional, but that use case is actually quite rare. Um, so what this means is that, for example, we can write code like this. Um, the, this is code that uses optionals, and so we want to look up a user um, in our mailing list. Um, if it has an email, we want to get that email, and then we want to remove it from the subscription list, and if that changed, we want to invoke a callback. Um, this is how we write it imperatively, uh, but we prefer writing it using and then. So we look up the user, this returns an optional, and then we want to do something to get the email. So uh, we get the user, we return the optional email. And then we want to remove it from the subscriber list, which returns a bool, and we sort of treat a bool like an optional void. So the final lambda is essentially only invoked uh, when we re return true before. 
So this is a more declarative way of doing the, the same thing using like monadic operations to chain all the optionals together. And we prefer sort of this style of writing because we, we think it makes it more clear what's going on. Like you look at the user, you get the email address, you remove it from the subscription, and then you invoke the callback instead of all this ifs and early returns uh, and the other thing. But the most important stuff of our library is our range implementation. So it essentially started with custom ranges. So uh, similar to range v3, uh, we looked at boost ranges like uh, decades ago and decided that we wanted to write a better, better version and came up with the thing cell ranges. So they are very similar to the standard library implementation by, um, on the surface. So this is an example using the standard library. We create uh, integers from 1 to 20. We filter out all the, uh, we only want to keep the even integers. We then square them using transform, and then we can iterate over them and print them. And we can write very similar code using things. So. Um, so we don't have a pipe operator. Uh, instead, we just use regular function calls. Um, and we also use TC4 each instead of the range-based for loop. More about that later. But essentially, we can do very similar things. Um, but the difference with the standard is when you ask yourself, what even is a range? So on the standard, we've got iterator ranges. This is type that defines like begin and end, and then you've got iterators, which iterate over all the elements in turn. But it thinks that we've got two more kinds of ranges, generator ranges and index ranges. So consider um, this is a sort of a classical example uh, of Pythag Pythagorean triples using standard ranges. Um, so we want to generate yields all tuples x, y, z, where x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And we do that by iterating over the appropriate infinite ranges using the nested for each, and then yielding all the values where the condition is true. Um, and by this works, it's sort of a bit annoying to write, um, and it has like, it's not really, the compilers have trouble optimizing properly, uh, the compile times are bad, and things like that. So it's not really ideal. And the problem with that is the distinct between external versus internal iteration. Um, so with external iteration, like iterators, the caller controls the iter iteration. So when you're iterating over an iterator range, you have to decide to increment it. And like the caller has full control, it increments, it gets the new value. Um, but this means that any loops that an iterator naturally have needs to be awkwardly split to build a state machine because the iterator itself can't contain any loops. It can only do the next step. So you sort of have to build a state machine inside your iterator. Um, it's much easier with internal iteration. There, the iterator controls the iteration, um, but the and just invokes a callback provided to the caller. Uh, and so the iterator can just write a loop to get the thing. And coroutines are great because you're, with a coroutine, you can write internal iteration, but still get the control of external iteration. So with a coroutine using the generator, we can write Pythagorean triples just by writing three for loops, an if condition, and a yield. And this is very straightforward, but we still got external iteration. Um, because this thing then has an iterator interface because the code in suspends any time and then you can call again and so on. Essentially, we trick the compiler into generating the state machine for us. So code are great, but they require heap allocation in many cases. Um, they are somewhat opaque for the optimizer because you've still got the state machine in there. Um, and they are viral. Like once you've got a code in somewhere in the call stack, you have to do it in the entire call stack. Like you can't factor part of the, fun the function out into a non-coroutine and yield from there. Like everything has to be a coroutine. So I think that we've got this concept of generator ranges. And a generator range is simply a function that takes a callback. And then it will invoke that callback, we call that a sync, with every value um, that we want to yield. So the code looks very similar to the version of coroutines. We are returning a generator, which is this lambda that takes the sync. Then we've got our three loops, and then we're invoking that sync with every single value that we want to yield. The, I get, uh, the return of break becomes important later. And so we can write code, uh, code just like using coroutines, but it doesn't require any fancy optimizers because we've just got loops that invoke a callback. And then we can use it but just by using for each. And TC for each just takes the lambda that we've given it and pass that to the lambda returned by Pythagorean triples, which means it will be invoked for every value. And because we're using the invoke, the tuple will be automatically unpacked. And we can even do like break or continue, right? If the lambda returns break or continue, this is what that return of break macro is for. So when we invoke the sync and the sync returns break, then we want to propagate that break out. Um, and so this is the definition of return of break. Like if the expression returns break, propagate that break. And break or continue itself is just an enum. And that way we can sort of write coroutine style algorithms without any of the optimization problems that coroutines have. 
Um, they're fully cost expert. They're just very nice, straightforward, efficient code. We don't generate any state machines. We're just calling functions. And every iterator range can be trivially transformed into a generator range. So for example, we just use the range-based for loop. So this takes an iterator range and turns it into a generator. The flip side, however, isn't possible, right? This is the entire point of coding. So all our adapters, filter and transform and the algorithms, they provide both a generator and an iterator interface, but they prefer to use the generator interface because it is more efficient. It's also really easy to write. For example, this is filter. Filter takes a range and a predicate, and the generator version simply needs to return a lambda that invokes the sync only with values where the predicate is true. So we do a for each over the range and use a custom lambda that only forwards to the sync when the predicate is true. Right? This is filter. It's very straightforward to write. Uh, and this is concat. If you know how to, like concat takes multiple ranges and returns a range that invokes all of them in order. And if you've written concat using iterators, like it's a mess, you need to essentially, the concat iterator is essentially a variant of all these sub iterators. And like one is active and once that's reached the end, it switches to the next entry in the thing and starts iterating over that range. Like it's a whole thing, it's really slow because the optimizer can't really see through all this variant. Um, but with like our thing, like all we need to do is we're doing some fancy tuple iteration in there that's not important, but essentially we're just calling for each, for each argument in order. Right? This is very straightforward code. This is much faster than any ranges concat view can ever be because it's very straightforward code. We don't have to deal with any state machine in there. And yes, um, because we're doing generator ranges which just invoke the callback, we can make the callback um, generic and then we iterate before each of our tuple. It just works. Like we can use for each to do the, this is a list of types for each type and do all the range algorithms in there just naturally falls out of by just giving it a generic lambda instead of a fixed up. And that isn't possible with iterators at all. So the second kind of ranges, um, let's consider iterator ranges in detail again. So we've got a range, we've got an iterator and the sentinel. And the iterator stores the state, so it remembers the current position in the range. Uh, but it also has the operations, like you can dereference stuff, you can increment uh, the value, and you can check whether the end. So the iterator has the state and the logic. <coughs> we use index ranges a lot. With an index ranges, we've got this index type. And this only stores state. It doesn't have any of the logic. The logic is instead in the range object. So you can ask the range for the begin index, just like you can ask an iterator range for begin. But you also need to ask the range to dereference an index or to increment an index, or to check whether they're at the end. And again, this is a duality. Um, like Both interfaces are equally powerful. You can turn any um, it, uh, index into an iterator by just wrapping it together with a pointer and the index, and then forwarding to the appropriate member functions. And you can turn any um, index uh, iterator into an index range by just using the iterator as an index and then providing just functions that call the operations on the thing. So you don't lose anything with that. However, index ranges are in many ways superior because an iterator can dangle. Like you can have a vector, you can have an iterator into that vector, and then you can destroy the vector, but you can still use the iterator. But you cannot do that with an index because by definition, you can't do anything with an index. You need the range in order to access it. So once the range is gone, like the index is just a piece of data that's lying around. So you can, will never have a dangling iterator using indices. It's just simply not possible. Indices are also less likely to invalidate it. Like an index into a vector isn't invalidated when the vector regrows, unlike an iterator, which is a pointer. We can also do efficient bounds checking. When we dereference the index, we are in the range object, which knows its size. So we can easily do a bounds check in there. When you de uh, decrement, uh, like dereference an iterator, like you don't know the memory region you're in without having to store additional state in every iterator. And they are also space efficient when you're nesting adapters, which is a real problem that stitch ranges has. So this is, for example, filter view. Uh, it needs to store the base view and then the predicate. And then the iterator needs to store a pointer to the parent and the current position. And it needs the pointer because when we do the increment, we need to loop until we find the next element. And this requires accessing to the parent to figure out when it's done and what's the predicate. So every iterator stores a pointer and the current position. However, using indices, um, the index stays the same. We just need to remember the position in the base range, so we don't need to store any additional state. 
And then when we do the logic, we're inside the filter adapter anyway, so we don't need to store a pointer. Right? We can just naturally uh, access all our members as we want. So what this means is that when we, example, have a standard version filter of a filter of a filter of an input, the view needs to store the input and then three, the predicate three times, once for each nesting. And an iterator stores the underlying iterator of the input and then three pointers to filter view because each copy of the filter has its own pointer to its sub thing. So we're essentially storing like an iterator plus three pointers in every nested um, iterator. But with indices, we don't need to do that. Like the range still looks the same, we store the input and the three copies of the predicate, but like the index is exactly the same type as the underlying input index. So we don't need to store any additional data because we don't need to remember any additional state. Of course, an index isn't an iterator, but when we turn that into an iterator, we just need to add one pointer. So we're saving two pointers for the intermediate nesting by using it in terms of indices instead of iterators. And this scales a lot. Like we're using ranges for everything. Like we've got entire files that are just one big range expressions with like deeply nested stuff and we're saving a lot of uh, memory there. The standard library also has output iterators. Um, and those are iterators that are write only. For example, you can use the train copy to copy a vector to a pointer. And this essentially boils down to mem copy. We're just mem copying the contiguous chunk over. So this is good. Then we're having a deck. So a deck is in memory, it's essentially like a linked list of arrays. Um, but when we do ranges copy, we, we don't really get the mem copy optimization. Instead, we loop over the thing contiguously and just put each element into the pointer, even though we could do like contiguous chunks but the uh, implementation doesn't do that optimization. And then when we call, um, want to copy something to another uh, vector using back inserter, we call pushback instead of each element, instead of just using insert other vector dot end, give the entire vector. So output iterators are great for like copying single things, uh, but we want to copy chunks as well. So we've got the appender interface instead. And the appender, just like an output iterator, can be used to append a single thing, but also has a chunk. And the chunk takes a range appropriately constrained to whatever is the use case. And so this gives us an opportunity to append entire ranges at once. We then have this function tc append, which takes a container and a bunch of ranges, and it asks the container, hey, what's the best way to append stuff to you? And this gives us the opportunity to optimize it. For example, appending something to a vector um, will return an appender that has like a chunk version that calls the range insert at the end for an appropriately input range. And that way we can get a much more efficient copying by just copying chunks at a time whenever possible. And then we also do explicit cast um, automatically, again, for convenience to do any conversion. For example, from const chars to strings or whatever. And all of this is built on top of for each. This is sort of like the primary building block that we use. And it tries in order, so it first tries to do chunking. If that fails, it uses like a special customization point. Otherwise, it assumes it's a generate range. Otherwise, it uses index iterations because they use more bound stacks, uh, less invalidation. And finally, it uses plain old range-based for loop using iterators. So I think that we don't use the range-based for loop ever. Um, this has two reasons. Uh, first is the simple Sean Perron philosophical, like no row loops. Uh, when you have a simple, sing, uh, simple range based for loop, it tends to grow over time, so you should use algorithms at once. Um, and then the second reason is simply pragmatic, like the range based for loop doesn't work with generator ranges. And we've got like a lots and lots of generator ranges, so we can't use the range based for loop, we have to use TC for it. And then we've got a bunch of uh, convenience algorithms. Um, like, for example, we've got filter in plate, which predates the standardization of erase, uh, which is the erase remove if idiom and predates like std erase uh, or std remove, uh, which was added a while back. Um, stuff like take first in place, which truncates a container to the size, uh, combinations to like a sort unique of a container and so on. But my favorite thing is that we got controls for, for example, what find returns. Like, standard find gives you an iterator. But maybe you wanted a subrange or a bool or the element itself. So we've got this range return thing, which controls exactly what it returns. For example, we can pass in return value or none. This is a policy and then find gives you an optional T. Or return bool. This is then essentially turns find into contains. Or you can get the element index in an optional, or you can have like the subrange from the beginning until the found position or the subrange from the beginning to the end. We've got like literal dozens of these policies to customize whatever we want find to return. 
And then we've got more algorithms that are specialized. Um, like that, like it's really convenient to be able to just don't get the iterator, but like customize it. Like we're saving so many algorithms, but just having the more generic policy based version. It's so convenient. So I want to also talk about the way we handle strings. So we handle strings very simply. Strings are just ranges. We don't treat them in any way special. So strings are ranges, but ranges of what? Like what's the encoding? So we use UTF-8 by default. Um, but we're writing a plugin for Microsoft PowerPoint, so we need to interact with the Win API. So we have a bunch of UTF-16 in there. And then we've got many ASCII string networks. What character type do we use? Well, in an ideal world, we would use char 80 for UTF-8, char 16 t for UTF-16, and char for ASCII. However, in practice, um, char 80 was added way too late. And like now, no existing library or interface takes char 80. And the Win API uses WhiteChar and not Char16, so we can't use Char16 T either. Um, so in the reality, we use Char for UTF-8. Um, we want to use Char16 T for UTF-16, and we do that on macOS. But on Windows, we have to use WhiteChar T. And then, what do we use for ASCII? Like we want to have a separate type for ASCII, um, so we added one. Uh, char ASCII is simply a Char between zero and seven F. And this is a strong type def. It both for documentation. And it also does like runtime checks to ensure that it's only ASCII. And it also enables optimized overloads. Like a bunch of Unicode algorithms are transcoding a trivial on ASCII only input. So when we've got an ASCII string literal, we know that it's char ASCII, we see this character type, and then we don't need to do anything special. So there's a bunch of optimizations for that. So then we've got the problem with string literals. For starters, they don't use char ASCII and all the character tests that we want, and then they have this problem. So ranges size string literal ABC, what's the result of that? Four. Four, right? Because ABC is an array of three characters and a null terminator. And because we use ranges for everything, this is really awkward, right? Uh, because every, every string is like one too long. So there is, the end includes the null terminator, and there's no really distinction between like a static string literal and a temporary array in the type system. And also the value is no longer really statically known um, because it's just like a runtime reference to some constant data. So instead we use a user-defined um, uh, UDL, user-defined literal, underscore TC. This takes the string literal as a non-type template parameter, so it's encoded in the type system. And then we're creating a custom type. And this custom type is empty because the value is entirely encoded in the type and it has the correct begin and end. So begin and end will do the correct thing and not include the null terminator for this type. And then we're also automatically tweaking the character type. So when you write a UTF-8 string literal using our TC, you will actually get a uh, string literal of type char because that is the type we use for UTF-8 and not char 80. Similarly, when you use like a Unicode 16 string literal, this will become a range of white char T under Windows because that's the type that we want. And we can sort of do this conversation at compile time entirely in the type system. And if you don't use any prefix, we assume it's ASCII and will give you like a range of char ASCII. So this is where we get the type. And because everything is like encoded into the type system, like in principle, we can start doing like unrolling optimizations if you have like algorithms that take a string literal. Because everything is known at compile time in the type system, we can do very efficient compile time string processing of all the literals, which is really nice. So we use to string to store runtime strings. Um, but simply because it has SSO, right? A vector of char doesn't have it, so we don't use it. We don't use any of the special member functions string has because we use algorithms. Strings are just ranges, so we manipulate them using the same algorithms we manipulate any other data. Like we don't call any member functions on start string ever. And similarly, string, string views is just our span, right? We don't use a special type of string view, we just use the same span that we use for everything else. String arguments aren't really different from any other subranges of any other range. Like strings aren't special, like they're just ranges. So string formatting um, is now part of C++20 using the uh, based on formatting. Um, this is sort of like now the standard way. You've got this DSL, uh, which has placeholders, and then this embedded DSL inside it to control the formatting. Except not entirely, some formatting is done outside by using like special tag functions to control the thing. Um, and the entire thing either eagerly creates the string or pushes to an output iterator. We don't do that. Instead, we use our regular range algorithms. Like to concatenate strings, we use TC concat. 
So we will say the answer is string literal. Then we give stack. stack takes an integer and lazily returns a range of characters that is the decimal representation of that integer. And then we concatenate the other thing. And instead of the MAC address example with like the DSL and whatnot, we transform each byte into a padded hexadecimal range and then join them together with a separator. And this lazily produces a range, which we can then pass to TC append or whatever to do the thing. Right? Um, we write our entire website backend in HTML, uh, in C++, and we've got like files and files of C++ that are just one big TC concat that lazily concatenates the entire range of characters of the HTML, which we then pass to like a socket using TC append. Right? So we do, do that for everything. Like we just use the regular range algorithms to do all the formatting, and then we've got special ranges that turn some value into like a range of characters. Of course, for internationalization, we still want placeholders. Right? So we've got TC placeholders, which has the format style thing, and then we've got the strings in there, that, which we then get translate, pass to our translators to get them translated into UI and whatnot. Um, but unlike the std format, the placeholder doesn't do any formatting. Right? We don't want the translators to change the way, the position of numbers, the way formatted, right? We don't want to give them control over that. So we just give them uh, the ability, so this is the string, this is the placeholders, and then we use named placeholders to make it really clear which value is being inserted at what position, and then we use TC named to like generically name it. Similarly, files. Files are just ranges. Okay. So to read a file, well, every file is a generator range. So we just call for each. This gives us each byte. And then we can build essentially parsing on top of that. And for writing, well, TC append, right? We append data to a file. And then we've got like special range adapters. For example, size prefix takes the range, first appends the size, um, and then the range characters, or as blob, which simply turns some data into like a range of unsigned chunks. And this is like the way we handle all files. So the library is a lot more extensive. Um, we've got so many more stuff. We've got the usual in macro based enum reflection everybody has, right? So we've got a macro to declare an enum, and then we've got like traits to get the thing. Um, really cool is like all values, which gives you a, like a generator range of all the possible enum values, um, which is useful in many times. We've got specialized data structures, we've got an optional reference. Uh, we've got a, like a static vector with an upper level bound capacity. We've got efficient mapping from like enum values to t's. Um, we've got parsing. Uh, like I've I gave a CPP con talk about JSON parser um, that we deployed in our code base. It's really cool. It's really fast, um, faster than essentially everything except simply JSON out there, um, and like a bunch of cool stuff. Like it's um, most of it is open source. Um, it has a bunch of cool ideas that we are working to do, especially the range of stuff. Um, we're working to integrate the optimizations using generator ranges into the standard library and things like that. Uh, so there's a bunch of cool stuff in there. Um, again, it's, uh, it's on GitHub, that URL, I've just pushed a new update. Um, it's like, like we don't promise any kind of backwards compatibility with it. Um, so I wouldn't advise you to just start using it directly uh, into the code base because I'm changing a lot in there and I'm refactoring our code base, but I'm not going to refactor your code base that's using it. Um, it's more like an inspiration of these sort of ideas. We will copy our ideas, but I wouldn't advise depending on our code directly in production. And uh, again, like we're hiring. So if you want to work with it and get like the guaranteed refactoring when I change the library, um, you have to apply and work for us. Thank you. Ah, I knew. Uh, one tiny question. Do mm. you use static analysis to actually uh, check that you have all the banned things that you don't want to use, in, that you don't yes. get that in the code base? Yeah, uh, so we don't use static analysis for that. Um, I really want to start deploying it and writing our own crank tidy checks to do that. A lot of it, most of it is done via code review or strategically placed, placed static assert. Um, like like the function pointers. Like if you pass a function pointer or anything, you will trigger a static assert that please don't pass function pointers and stuff like that. But a lot of it is done by a code reviews only at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Oh. This is more a feature request for the committee than anything else. But can you scroll back to the um, return if the macro? Yes. The I know what you're going to say. So the, the yeah, that one. Uh, 
Actually, Asia has the same concept and we use it a lot in protocol implementations because uh, if you, the, the, the non-IO part uh, is like a state machine. So it would be really great uh, having uh, some sort of coroutine type that doesn't allocate, that is like a lambda that you can resume, but saves you from writing these things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Barry Weston has a proposal to add like a try operator for return of break. It um, looks like you are going to write a proposal. <laughs> More? Oh. Thanks. Uh, how can how can we get a copy of the library? Just like going to the repo and yeah, downloading yeah, it's, it. Yeah, like it's uh, go on Things are Library. Uh, okay. on GitHub, yeah, or it's all there. Can we get it with Conan or some package manager? Uh, no, no. So it's not on the package manager because then that would like 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 it's currently like it's open source, but the open source part consists of me periodically copy pasting everything into a GitHub repository. I want to migrate the actual development process on there as well, but it's not like they keep sending me to too many conferences in order to have the time to actually set that one up. So it's not on any package managers and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. And also, so it, it has this idea of everything is, is a range, right? Kind, everything kind is a what? Uh, a range. Yes. 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 But uh, we can also take uh, the other parts, like, uh, for instance, you had uh, something very similar to reflection in enums, yes. and that we don't have to like use ranges for that or something. Uh, like yes, like yes. That. So, so the 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 parts itself can be used independently, but like the actual implementation is like one big blob of interdependency. Um, but you can th this doesn't show up in the interface. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. And uh, you've said that you uh, implement uh, half of Rust's ownership model. Yes. And I'd like to know if I can get like a two paragraph executive summary or if I should wait for your yeah, talks. Yeah, so the, video. the essential thing is that the TC invoke macro is a macro because I want to. Uh, yeah. So it's a macro because it essentially does a decal type of every argument to distinguish between PR values and actual references. And then I keep, I turn PR values into like a TC temporary type lifetime, where the lifetime is an integer that controls the number, how many scopes ago the source created. And then when you pass it to a function, you increment the lifetime by once. And when you return it, you decrement it. And when you've got to like return a temporary null zero, this means it was created in the same scope and we need to decay it. Otherwise, we can return it by an R value reference. It's the basic idea. Ah, okay, yeah. so that's, that explains also the TC move. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. Actually, the TC move is uh, the does checks, um, like we don't want to move a const thing. And when you write like TC move object dot member, um, we ban that um, because then it's not clear whether object really, like we want to TC move of an L value reference that you got from somewhere else is potentially dangerous because you don't really have ownership truly over it, so we don't want to move it. Uh, but if you write, for example, TC object dot member, you lose that de detection. So I've got like a thing that looks like the stringified representation. And if you write object dot member, you get a static assert. You have to write TC move object and then dot member and ah, okay. stuff like that. So yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. We have a question. Okay, thank you very much.